Yes, well, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity to speak here and uh, just to say that Irish Aid is extremely happy to have this opportunity and extremely happy with the, uh, with the relationship with uh, the Institute uh, and uh, delighted to provide support to, uh, to the development series uh, that gives us these opportunities to, to interact um, with uh, opinion leaders and shapers um, from, uh, uh, from really a global level with, um, uh, with people from, uh, from, from uh, Ireland as well. Um, what I just want to talk a bit about, and I'll, tr I'll try to be brief, although it's difficult following the, uh, all the thoughts that came into my head as, uh, as uh, uh, Schengen uh, uh, was speaking earlier on. What I want to focus on really is, is um, wh what are the um, r links between resilience and, uh, and nutrition that are, um, uh, are particularly important? And actually, I want to ask the question if a resilience approach is in some sense enough or whether there are other things that we need uh, to be doing as well. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, obviously, it's very busy, there's no need uh, to look at it, but this is essentially the same conceptual framework that Schengen put up in terms of what are the things that, that drive nutrition. This is actually, I think, an adaptation of the UNICEF one that's been around for a long time that was done by the Lancet, which has a series on maternal and child um, maternal and child. Uh, nutrition uh, and really, there's kind of three vectors that uh, that lead towards nutrition outcomes. And the, and the first one here is uh, around availability and access of nutritious food. This one here is around uh, practices in households and communities around feeding and caregiving and, and utilisation. And this one here is about the importance of uh, health status and access to health services for 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 nutrition outcomes. Um, and what I really want to think about was just, you know, I mean, this, this presents us with three kind of streams that are of equal weight and importance because of the way that it is presented. Uh, and I think that we, we would be concerned in Irish Aid that actually, uh, kind of, in a lot of our programme countries, which are LDCs, that lack of progress on the income and access side is actually becoming a much more, uh, a more and more critical issue. Um, and we would say that the income constraint is becoming more significant. Now, not only as that uh, chart showed us, is it directly, does it have a direct impact itself on the ability of households to access, uh, to access nutritious food, um, but also it's beginning to affect all the other vectors as well. We've seen, for example, in, in Tanzania, um, that the, the, the rate of use of health services uh, um, by the poorest part of the population, by the poorest 20%, is declining. In the period between 2001 and 2008, it declined by 20%, which is a massive drop, especially considering that we were investing a lot of money in expanding health services. Whatever. And the same thing is true as well. You know, Income uh, and the lack of, of, of livelihoods actually affect, for, for example, if you have a, uh, a programme uh, as we've discussed around uh, mainstream nutrition into your agricultural sector policies and, and agricultural services. Uh, lack of income, lack of livelihood opportunities on the part of poor rural people actually mean they don't engage with those. They don't see the use of extension services. If the market doesn't allow them to sell products at a reasonable price, if there isn't a demand for the products, they won't engage with the extension services and therefore they won't benefit from the investments and the messages around nutrition that we might be uh, trying to put it through. So in its own right, it constrains the access and uh, the income constraints, constrains access to entitlement to, uh, to, uh, to nutritious food, but also affects the other things uh, that we're doing. So in terms of the nutrition and resil nutrition resilience links, yes, we do need uh, nutrition sensitive uh, resilience building interventions. So we do need resilience in things uh, put into things like our social protection programs. Sorry, we need nutrition put into our uh, social protection programs, nutrition mainstream through agriculture. But as well, we really need to think about this, uh, this chain, which is resilience uh, as being um, uh, one of the factors that enables people to have more sustainable livelihoods, more profitable household economies, more opportunities to, to, to gain an income and to be able to access uh, to be able to access food. 
uh, and that that process leads to nutrition. So uh, this also needs to be included in, in, in the way that we uh, programme. So we need to think about resilience very strongly about how it delivers profitable, profitable and productive agriculture and livelihoods for poor and poor uh, smallholders uh, and rural households. The other point I wanted to raise quickly was, is resilience really enough? And I think there's an argument for it that focusing exclusively or overly focusing on resilience uh, does give us the risk of missing some critical issues. The first thing about the resilience approach is it is dom denom dominated by the idea of dealing with risk. Right? So risk is something that is unpredictable and beyond control. Right? And actually, uh, and some things are just like that. So the impacts of climate change are unpredictable, although we know they will happen regularly. Their particular incidence isn't predictable. And they are beyond the control of people and of communities uh, and of governments. But actually, many of the constraints, they're, maybe they're not risks because they are quite often, they're not shocks because they are quite often uh, chronic Situations, chronic stresses which people live in. For example, the problem of prices for producers, uh, or indeed prices for uh, uh, low prices for producers, high prices for uh, for consumers. Um, but they are quite predictable. The other thing about resilience is it, it's more about. Sorry, just to say that the things we are talking about really uh, are more about insecurities. Uh, and disempowerment rather than shocks. So uh, a, a rural producer, a rural household that is trying to make a, a, a living, it does face shocks of the climate type, of disease type, uh, of pests, but it also faces ongoing insecurity and disempowerment in markets. In other words, households, um, who, who producer households do not have the ability to influence prices. Uh, do not have uh, do not have security that a market will be there if they do <coughs> produce. If households um, invest in using fertilisers, invest in, in, in more productive uh, in more productive seeds, or indeed if they uh, start using more nutritious crops, producing more nutritious crops, they don't have any security that the market will be available there uh, to give them uh, a value uh, to do that. And many of these issues, particularly around market failures, they may be beyond the control of the individual or a community, but they're not beyond the control of the state uh, or of public action. In other words, many of these things are amenable to public policies uh, and actions. For example, uh, issues around warehousing, storage, prices, issues around the price, uh, prices of produce, prices of inputs, <coughs> issues around access, you know, uh, how, uh, how good is the rural road infrastructure, how good are, are, is market infrastructure, all of these things are amenable to, uh, uh, to, public, um, uh, to public action. So the, the other point I would think about it is, is that um, vol uh, resilience tends to focus, it focus on the individual uh, and the household or the community. Now that's fine, that's absolutely right. We need to focus on poor people and the most vulnerable. But it kind of sees, um, it kind of sees people uh, as... The, the vulnerability of people as a problem. So you're focusing on building the resilience of households or of in, individuals uh, or, or of people. And, and it seems to be about people, for some reason or another, are living in this very insecure and unsure environment, and we need to build that capacity to be able to manage that better. Yes, we do. But actually, there are things that we can do to improve uh, the environment in which they're in which they're living. So it's not just about dealing with a very bad uh, about their ability to deal with a very bad situation. It's about promoting as well public policies and action <coughs> to improve that environment and make it less hostile. So the approach on resilience, I think, it runs that risk of being uh, providing a sort of a rather limited ambition. It doesn't push enough for systemic change. Uh, in, in the context uh, that we're working about, and it sort of de responsibilizes the state and public policy and, and action by focusing on, uh, on, on the individual's ability to deal with uh, that situation. I just wanted to put up this next graph, which is just to give one example 
of one of the issues, and it's been mentioned already. Um, this is maize prices in Malawi, uh, and it's actually this is a, an IFPRI uh, piece of research uh, that produced this. But this is very interesting. I mean, there it's January zero eight, so this is when the, the global uh, price crisis was uh, just about starting. But you can see, uh, sorry, just to be sure, all, it's all different coloured lines. Those different coloured lines are all different rural markets in Malawi. This black one is the, the world price for maize. This is for maize. So you can look at, look at the total non-relationship between the world price and the prices in, 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 in rural markets. Uh, in, in Malawi. That's one thing to say. The other thing is the obvious huge volatility in it, right? And all of it predating the time, predating the time when suddenly it came onto the, the global agenda as a big issue, price volatility. But actually, this isn't really price volatility. This, again, is quite predictable. It's happening so regularly. Now, the size of the peak is it changes from year to year, and there'll be reasons for that. But you can see that in this, in 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 the uh, market and the rural economy that this represents, it is there is there are severe problems, uh, totally economically unjustifiable price wedges between uh, the time at harvest and the time uh, uh, at lean period experienced by people. In this context, people cannot. Uh, really be expected to produce or to invest in increasing their production in, 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 uh, uh, in agriculture. This is a very hostile environment. And it is, you know, I think people have the, the right to expect that their government and, and their state uh, should have public policies in place to try to, uh, to iron this out. If that was about, the, the, if that was about law and order, uh, or, or, or conflict. You, something you would do something to deal with the issues systemically. You know, we, we talk about the need, and it is a valid thing to do, to for farmers to organise themselves, and we should support them so that they have more power in the market, so they can build their local stores and put off selling the maize for for three weeks. But we wouldn't be advocating for them to form self defence groups or vigilante groups to go out and deal with crime. You know, and the same thing should apply here. There are expectations that citizens should have of government, and uh, and we need to push them forward. And okay, sorry, thank you. So uh, the last point, the last slide that I wanted to say was that actually we need to think about reducing the resilience requirement. It isn't only about making people more resilient, it's about reducing the need for them to be so resilient, particularly to the things which are amenable to. Um, uh, to public policy. And I think some of these are critical. These are the sorts of things that we see. So access to land, pasture and water and security over access, prices and costs and, uh, and uh, entitlements uh, to food. And the general message is, of course, don't, it isn't about deprioritizing or not doing resilience. It's about how resilience instruments actually work best as part of a an overall supportive <laughs> framework of public policies uh, and actions uh, that work in the rural economy and that focus on the same target groups that we're talking about. And I think there's a really important area of work to do, which is about re-legitimising active public policy in the rural economies in, le in least developed countries. It's something which has been delegitimized for the last... Or, or, anyway... It has been delegitimized significantly, and it's something. And I think there's a there's a, a growing consensus of the need to actually uh, to address this. And I think um, work needs to be done. I think IFPRI is a very good partner to, to to be doing this sort of work to support the design and delivery of smart and flexible policy in, in interventions. Uh, policies aimed at prices or uh, are not easy things to do. Uh, and they, they can have lots of perverse outcomes and they can benefit, they can, benefit, uh, they can be regressive and all sorts of things. Uh, and the other thing that I think that we need to do, and again, if brief, particularly the more it is involved in, in that developing country level, is to build a public debate and national analytical capacity in, in LDCs to improve the political economy of actually delivering these sorts of uh, instruments. Thank you Thanks very, very much. much.